it's not chat. I think it's <laughs> just let you know. That's what you should. You need a button measure. Do what? Do you need a button measure? Oh, it's so funny though. We brought one of these, like I got one in my bag. Oh, okay. yeah, yeah. Like, oh, Two things. I need one of these to talk, and I need something to stand on to keep me from wandering too far. <laughs> the microphones and all that. Right. Ready? I'm ready. Want to introduce you? Or? We're not going to have music. I don't get to run out of <laughs> Nothing like that. Uh, hey, everybody, welcome to B-Sides 2024. This is the In the Clouds track, and my name is Chip Thornsberg. So uh, we're going to talk about competitions and competencies. Uh, subtitle there, How to Hack Your Way into the Cyber Workforce. Um, we're going to talk a bit about the cyber workforce shortage. I'm sure if you're looking for a job, if you're in school, you continually hear these figures. So we're going to talk about how real those actually are. We're going to talk about skill gaps, uh, the role of work roles, two roles there, uh, competitions, employer attitudes about those competitions, and then a couple of tips for upskilling uh, if you're trying to move into the field of cybersecurity. Um, so I am the uh, program coordinator for cyber defense at Northeast Lakeview College, so one of the community colleges, one of the Alamo district colleges. We are up. Um, Kitty Hawk and 1604 on G, the northeast side of town, <laughs> appropriately named. Um, I've been in this game for a long time. Uh, that means I'm old, right? So uh, first tech company, 96. Uh, I'm still actively a peace officer and do electronic crimes investigations, uh, part of the Secret Service uh, Electronic Crime Task Force uh, and the regional ransomware response teams um, that, that work out of South Texas. Um, have taught at various places, um, actually have some formal education too. Um, so my first hack, using something like this, 1982, and that was Angelo State University, because way back in the day, none of you would know this, but they had this amazing Star Trek game um, that you could play, right, if you could find it in their system. Um, and that's, you know, so trying to get into that mainframe was, a, was kind of a big, big thing. And just to talk about that subject, right? How to hack your way into the career field. Back in the day, so back then in 1982, it wasn't even against the law to break into a computer system yet. Um, nowadays, it absolutely is. So, and, and so if you find yourself thinking about, hey, I just need to do an unscheduled pen test of a company and then they're gonna wanna hire me, those days are long past. Um, what you'll do is you'll break in, then you'll disclose everything, and then they'll turn it over to the FBI and you'll wind up doing the perp walk, right? And so two really big examples of that. So Marcus Hutchinson, uh, if you've ever read that story, it's pretty interesting. So here's a guy who literally single-handedly saved the internet from a really nasty worm that was running around. And then he turns around and gets arrested by the FBI. Uh, and if you're not familiar with Aaron Schwartz, that's another great um, story. So. Two brilliant, brilliant people that wound up getting sideways with law enforcement. And at one point, I mean, it, Aaron, it cost him his life. He committed suicide over the whole thing. So um, that is not the path to go down anymore. So enough of that. So we see this all the time, right? Four million is the new expect, right? So there are four million unfilled cybersecurity jobs in the profession. And we see help wanted, right? Cybersecurity specialist. And so then where's my job? Um, if there's 4 million unfilled positions out there, why do we have such a struggle breaking into this job field? And so that's really what we're going to spend some time on today. So um, the ISC squared reports that there are 5.5 million people in the cybersecurity workforce that's nationwide, or excuse me, I said that's worldwide. So if they're saying there's 4 million unfilled jobs, so somewhere these numbers don't exactly match up because we're talking about we need to basically double our existing workforce. So 50% of the jobs that are out there are unfilled and that's not probably reality. Um, 
In 2022, there were 44, uh, 440,000 new jobs created. 43% um, of employers though, and this is a big thing, this is sort of one of our, our main themes, right? Report there's a significant skills gap. They need people to be able to do a certain thing and they can't find talented, talented people. 75% um, say that is a considered a most challenging threat to their uh, success as a company, this, this skills gap. 22% um, of companies reported layoffs in 2022 of cybersecurity people. That's better than the average tech company because 51% of those were laying people off. We've seen big, right, Google axed a bunch of people, Amazon, I mean, we've, we've seen those things happen and again, that if we have four million unfilled jobs, why are we laying people off? And so a lot of that has to do with the skill sets that they're looking for that they need to fill. 30% um, of companies are expecting budget cutbacks. And so we talk about trying to break into the field. There's always this conversation about which is more important, experience or education, um, right? We, we see that, right? How many people are doing a four-year or have a four-year degree in cybersecurity-ish? Okay. So that's always sort of a challenge for us is to say, wait, if I've got my degree, does that open the door for me? And the answer is sort of. Um, at senior level positions, 86% of the people responding to these say they want experience. Only 14% say, yeah, we want somebody with a PhD. So getting your PhD in cybersecurity might not be, unless you're in academia, right? That, that might not be the best use of your funds or time. Entry level positions, 70% prefer experience. Only 30% prefer a bachelor's degree. But then we get into that, how's, how is it entry level if I have to have experience? And so it's not just work experience, we're gonna talk a bit about that too. So, interactive portion. Why do companies hire someone? It's okay to yell back at me. <laughs> they need somebody to do a thing, right? We need this task completed. We need somebody to do this thing. That's why they're hired. That's why they're hiring. And so, they do the job post. Right, so outcomes of cybersecurity job post, and here's this new unfilled position, and it's entry level, but we still might want all of these things, and then immediately here come all of the cybersecurity applications that come in, because every person out there in the job force knows that if you want to make money, this is one of those fields where people get paid a lot of money. And so it is not unheard of for even small companies to get four or 500 applications, resumes come in for one position, that's locally. When you talk about national companies, they can go up into the thousands of applications coming in, right, for that one position they're trying to fill. So if you're not familiar, there is a tool that was created by the federal government. It's called the uh, Cyber Careers Pathway Tool. Google that if you are looking to jump into the job market because this lists out every one of the federal job titles. And it's cool, we can't really do interactive in here, but when you hover over one of those, it shows you these are the jobs that feed into that, and these are the jobs that come after that. So you can see where it fits into this kind of, the uh, ecology of a, of a career field. That's what it's designed to do. If you click on any one of them, it will show you all the related job titles that are with that, and then you can look at the specific tasks. And it says, so as a cyber defense analyst, one of the tasks is, Develop content for cyber defense tools. Analyze network traffic. Identify anomalous activity. So it lists all of those things out. So if you're applying for a position as an analyst, this is what that position needs to be able to do. And it also does knowledge and skills and abilities. List those. So you can see exactly what that position needs for you to be successful. And you can sort of compare and contrast your current skill set your experiences and how those line up with that particular job. Um, 
brand new that they just came out. So the, the bottom one down here, it says micro challenge. It's actually an interactive little competition, if you will. If anybody's ever done Hack the Box or some of those other competitions we're talking about those, this, this is what that is. It's a little, here's what you would have to do, and it presents you a little, sort of a taste of this job. And if you can complete that micro challenge pretty easily, that's a pretty good indication that you have the skill set to perform that particular job function. So that's a new thing they put out. It's really pretty cool. They haven't been very clear about how they're uh, collecting the data on that. My sense is so someone at some point is they're looking at people going through those things and identifying potential candidates. Um, that is something that large scale employers, particularly federal government, have been known to do in the past. So we talked about that education versus experience, and then I'm gonna throw in the third part, versus skills, right? So these are the kind of the three overlapping areas when it comes to getting into the workforce itself. And so in this little place where they all intersect, we refer to that then as competencies, right? So it's all of your experiences, your ability to perform that task. Remember, that's why they did the job post in the first place. We need someone to do this task, right? And so that little spot in there is where all of those things come together and hopefully you've developed competency in that particular task or area. Um, for those who are working your way through a college program, uh, most all the schools now in San Antonio have the designation from the NSA as a Center of Academic Excellence or Program of Academic Excellence. Part of that requirement um, is that students be at least offered the opportunity to participate in competitions um, and these, these challenge type environments. Um, the downside is there's no real definition of that and very little actual research is done. Um, I joined up with uh, Barbara Hewitt at Texas State and we said, hey, we're gonna, we're gonna do an actual academic study and figure out who, which competencies are out, or which competitions are out there? How do employers view these things? Is it actually something worthwhile for our students to do? And so we announced that at a meeting, and then promptly, uh, Dan, that's not really Dan. That's really Dan. But Dan jumps up and I think says, "Well, what do you mean by competitions? There's all kinds of competitions." I'm like, ah, valid point, Dan. Grumpy though you come across. Um, the, the genesis of all of these competitions goes back to the military of all places um, and this concept of war game. So the military has long been known for that, right? We can't go out and use live ammunition and shoot at each other in order to train, right? That doesn't make sense. It's dangerous, duh, it's expensive, right? And so they came up with things like tabletop exercises, which there's another talk going on today about tabletop exercises. I heard that's going to be a great one. Um, the guy who kind of is the, the uh, father of that modern war gaming is, is a guy named uh, Peter Perla. And he, he worked at the uh, U.S. Naval Institute for years and wrote a, actually a, a big book. When we talk about cybersecurity and cyber competitions, kind of can point back and say, those things started at DEF CON, hopefully you've all heard of DEF CON, um, out in Vegas. And so this was, hey, we're gonna present attendees of our conference this technical challenge, and we're gonna see who can solve that challenge the fastest, right? Or in the best manner. And so since that, that's from the 80s, right? So since that, lots and lots of competitions have been rolled out in different uh, sectors and, and fields. Um, if you are in San Antonio, by the way, the local DEF CON groups are starting back up. Um, so the last Thursday of the month, uh, and they're gonna be held at Northeast Lakeview uh, on our campus out there is where we're gonna actually host them um, to get that kicked back off. So um, if you're interested in that, those are great monthly meetings to come into. So different types of competitions, there's blue teams, right? So that's focused on network defense, um, most of those are system-based, running VMs. Uh, you score points by reconfiguring or configuring in a secure manner. Um, the goal is to practice that securing different systems and networks. Um, they tend to be highly academic. 
Cyber Patriots. Imagine everyone's heard of that one before. Uh, there's also uh, Hive Storm. So most of those are uh, free, uh, and they tend to be fairly academic oriented um, on the on the blue team stuff. Um, so red team, right? So the fun hacking stuff, right? We've got Hack the Box, Try Hack Me. There's some others that are out there. So that is more. Uh, we're going to put you in this virtualized private network. We're going to give you a series of targets. You're going to try and figure out how am I going to compromise the system? How am I going to break in? How am I going to... So you earn the points by poning, right? These different machines. Um, some of them are free. A lot of them, when you move beyond the basic level, it's a subscription model, um, but still a great place to uh, test out your skills. Uh, there are some hybrid models, right? So red versus blue, where you've got two teams in opposition. You've got a blue team running, you've got a red team running. So the big one is the uh, Collegiate Cyber Defense Competition, the CCDC. Um, that is a national competition. Uh, a lot of universities here in town, uh, you'll see competing in that. And so you have pen testers working at the same time. You have people trying to secure the network. So you're literally fighting off an adversary at the same time. So again, um, you award, are awarded points by actively defending successfully, like maintaining the security of your network while also compromising other people. Um, and that's a, a pretty robust uh, thing. Those are in person, those are not uh, virtuals. Um, other types, we have capture the flag, so we'll hear that referred to sometimes as a Jeopardy style. So you might have multiple categories of information that come out. Um, many of these are work role oriented, so we talk about when I'm writing my resume or I'm looking at what tasks do I need to complete that work role. So if you're gonna spend time competing and you have in your mind, I wanna work in this particular field and you wanna be a pen tester, then spending all your time in a blue team environment or pursuing blue team type certifications might not be the best way to spend your time, right? You would wanna orient more towards the red team stuff. Um, most all of these are very proprietary, very closely guarded secret of how they're rolling them out. Um, there are some free, but a lot of them are, uh, have subscription. They're generally fairly, fairly cheap though. So um, the SANS Holiday Hack Challenge is very forensic oriented on that one. Super fun. Uh, that one is free. Pico CTF is one that's out. Um, one that we actually participate in pretty heavily uh, it's the National Cyber League. So the National Cyber League um, has the uh, categories for OSINT, password cracking, cryptography, network traffic analysis, digital forensic log analysis, um, and then uh, also web application exploitation, enumeration, and scanning. So all those are different categories that, that students uh, or competitors uh, are placed into. You're trying to solve the challenge. Uh, there's lots of uh, great materials in that platform to learn because they provide you a, a gym um, with walkthroughs. So if you don't know how to do that particular thing, they're, they're going to give you a walkthrough um, and teach you how to do it. Um, me on. Uh, you can compete as an individual, uh, also as teams in that. So in that particular competition, it's high school through graduate level and they're just starting to try and sort them out. So you may have high school students competing against people that are in the field and, and trying to pursue a master's degree, all in the same environment. And it's all about who does it quickly and most accurately. That's how you're scoring those points. Um, for the last two years running though, a high school student won that competition in the individual, right? One, we'll assume, Right, because we don't want to feel bad about our own skills, right? We're going to say, well, he has all the time in the world. He doesn't have a family and a job and all the rest of this stuff. But the, the real takeaway is anyone can be successful and can be successful at whatever level they're at. So even if you've never done competitions before, starting and just learning how it works is a very important role. Uh, as, a, as a professor, I couldn't give someone a, a problem and say, hey, I want you to spend the entire weekend trying to solve this problem for my class, and you're gonna get a grade next week. Because they're gonna go, yeah, hard pass, pal. I got things to do, I gotta take my goldfish for a walk, I got other things, right? But in a competition environment, 
that's 56 hours and a lot of students are in that they might get four hours sleep the entire weekend right because they are grinding away trying to solve that and so it, it, that competitiveness really comes out it, it's a very interesting thing um, our particular school so this is not just a cool looking jersey right so the night hacks that is our um, competition team and and lakeview because uh, we're a community college right so we don't have great basketball teams and the rest so they treat our hacking team our competition team like a sports team there so they all have um this is a, a school issue jersey um hacker handle on the back right we wouldn't want anything boring like your regular name uh, so uh, it, it's a, it is a fun and, and worthwhile thing so the real question is what do companies think about Right, so the NSA thinks it's a great idea. Academics are like, oh, this is gonna be amazing. And again, who cares, right? What do hiring managers, what do people who run these companies, what do they actually think about this? Um, are they really a measure of competency? And the answer is yes. Um, so we surveyed um, first uh, about 100 hiring managers, and then we came back and we didn't like those responses. We were like, that, that seems oddly like supportive of this whole thing. And so we turned around and, and uh, surveyed another 60-something CIOs and CISOs using the same, same questions. Um, when we aggregate, 58% um, were very familiar with this cyber competition of different type. 11% actually had participated in them themselves. Um, so these are fairly high-level managerial types. So, that helps us when they start looking at resumes. Um, how likely were you, uh, would you be to consider uh, competing, right, as a raise, as promotion, uh, or in some form of recommendation? 23% um, of those people said, yeah, they would treat that as, as favorable. So even if you're working, uh, existing employers say, hey, you did something, you went out of your way, you're trying to better yourselves, we recognize that's something that's important, we want to support that as a, as a company. When we talk about people trying to break in, right? So for applicants or intern applicants, does your company consider participating a valuable experience? 92.6, that, that was the figure that threw us off. We're like, it can't be that high. Um, and it was, among both of those groups. It's really that high. 90 plus percent of these managers, hiring managers, CIOs, CISOs say, this is valuable experience. So when we talked about experience and education and skills, it's not just work experience. If you can document on your resume, I did this thing, right, in this context, here's what I did. That's what they're looking for on the resume and that's how you separate out from the other 500 resumes that hit their inbox when they post these positions oops um 60 said they have hired people that on their resume was yes they were listing on there that they were competing in these types of events so we ask about resume statements right which is which sort of um is, is more important to them, participating as a team or participating as an individual. Um, we had the assumption that it would be teams, right? So competing as a team because cybersecurity is absolutely a team sport, right? You, you have to be able to communicate with other people. You gotta be able to work with people even though you don't like them. Um, you may not like them, I shouldn't say, right? You, you gotta be friendly, you gotta get along. And the employers actually came back and went, we're more impressed when someone does it individually because they're taking that initiative, we assume, right, the answer is, you're taking initiative to uh, improve your skill set. And so that tends to hold a lot of weight. That along with things like creating a, I have run a test network at home so I can test these things, which we can all do virtually. Now it's, it's fairly cheap. Back in the day, you were trying to buy surplus equipment um, and, and having pieces of stuff all strung through your house. Uh, much easier these days to do things like that. Um, so the long and the short, add competitions to your resume. Um, how many people have done competitions before? And so all the rest of you should as well. Um, how many of you have that on your resume? Oh, yeah, that's pretty good. 
for you. Good job. Um, all the rest of you need to put it on your resume. Because again, this is something that differentiates you from all of those other places. Yes, sir? We were just talking about how we want to start looking for these things in, in the applicants we're looking at. Because we do value, I mean, all those numbers, you're correct. We value skills over and experience over education. And we definitely value DEF CON or other major uh, competitions, uh, whether team or individual. I, I don't personally care. But the fact that they're on your resume is something really nice to see. It's, there's a big part of that. So, um, there's this weird dynamic you, you know, that colleges do. We're going to help you write your resume because, well, you've got a degree. We're going to help you. And so you wind up on, well, I have knowledge of this and I have knowledge of that. And it's like, okay. I mean, I, I, I've seen very high, so I, I wind up doing a lot of hiring for, um, for Alamo colleges in the technical field, just based on my background. And I've seen people applying for director jobs, like in IT, you know, have knowledge of Microsoft office products. I'm like, so does every third grader, right? So good for you. Um, and, and again, you need to, we, we, we want to differentiate ourselves from all of those other applicants. And this is a good way to do it. It really is. Uh, because it's something that's um, abstract and it is, um, it's, you can validate it as an employee, right? So your uh, most all of those have um, scouting reports or some sort of end price. So you, you'll have some sort of documentation that says you did this thing in X amount of time or scored this level or you've got this ranking. Um, there are people on Hack the Box that are making tons of money, right? Because they're ranking in that, I don't know, last time I looked, 350,000 people in that platform or something, right? So if you're in the top 50 guys um, out of 350, you know what? That's some mad skills. Um, and so if it's applicable to the work world. Yeah. Uh, I apologize, I missed the intro. Um, I apologize, I missed the intro. Do you have a breakdown on offensive versus defensive competitions? Traditionally, they seem being towards the offensive side? Um, uh, we did, so... Um, I, I will make the slide deck available. I, I think we have the ability to do that. I'll, I'll make the slide deck available. So yeah, I actually list out blue team, red team, red versus blue. So yeah, we there's some of those. So um, here's some of the high. So talk about upskilling. Um, here are some of the high demand um, skills that employers are looking for. Um, anything with incident response. Um, whether or not it's the reporting part or it is the um, compliance issues of, right, look, are we meeting the compliance issues for this regulatory framework? Um, that is a big, big skill that's in demand now. And we have this conversation a lot with, with students. So um, how many people have ever worked fast food? Oh, come on now. So how many of you think that fast food, putting that on your resume, is applicable for cybersecurity? One. So let me ask you this. When you worked in that, did you have a checklist of things that you had to run down every single opening and closing and everything that you did? Yes, you did. Because everybody, that is no different than the NIST checklist that we have. Right. That is that is no different than the checklist that you're going to run down for the uh, so the, the one that's rolling out now, right? The cybersecurity maturity model that, that's being rolled out, right? Having that concept of I have this checklist, and it's not always just do this thing, right? Turn off this thing. It's more generalized, but having that ability to do that, yeah, that's that's actual valid experience. Um, for that, so that's a, a big thing. So even if your technical skills aren't super high, that's more of a soft skill, a managerial level thing, but having the ability to look at a compliance framework and then figure out how does this apply in our current environment, that's a huge skill and gets paid fairly well. Um, really specialized stuff, memory forensics, um, network traffic analysis. If you're starting to get into that, a lot of those uh, competitions 
we'll do that. So get good at Network Miner, get good at Wireshark, get good at some of those things. Uh, th those are really, really in-demand skills. Not a lot of people spend the time. Most academic programs, you're just getting a big, right? It was one slide and one presentation, and we talked about that. Well, okay, that's great. But actually using it and, and playing around and, and taking a network uh, a PCAP file and carving out a malicious file, right, and then starting to work through that reverse engineering thing, that is a super high skill level. And you don't have to spend a lot of money to learn it. There's tons of videos out there, there's workshops. I think there might be, I think there's going to be a workshop here. On, on some of the malware analysis or version engineering. So these are great places to, to start building those skills. Uh, let in there, malware analysis. So uh, if you're not a super great coder, that's okay. You don't have to be, right? But if you have the ability to just generally look at that and then start figuring out, here's how it works. Here's what it's doing. So determining those indicators of compromise. We're putting two-year students that are really an internship. So a year and a half long student in the cyber defense, we put them in with a local employer and that's what they're doing. They're doing threat hunting and they're determining what are the indicators of compromise and then that company's pushing that out to 70 other. So it's not something you need to have a PhD to be able to figure out. It's there, it's just about practicing and competitions are a great place for that. But there's other places you can learn as well. Um, and then the huge door for anyone to walk through that's trying to break into the field, operational technology, right? OT networks. And you don't, so this is gonna sound weird, right? You don't have to know all sorts of things about OT because the problem that we have with our OT networks, we're using TCP wrapper and we're saying, we're just gonna shove this thing into a regular network. So if you understand network traffic analysis, you also have the ability to do OT support because a lot of our OT networks now, because people don't want to have to drive into the office, that's terrible, right? I want to be able to connect across the internet and we see systems <coughs> compromised, right? Water treatment facilities, sewage plants. I mean, we're seeing those, those big breaches the reason why is that they're taking SCADA systems and they're just shoving them onto the internet because I need to have access from my home. So, um, you know, which, what could go wrong? Um, with your wholly unsecured protocol of communication and we'll just pipe that across the internet because nothing bad could happen. So, uh, those are all really in demand um, segments. Uh, you'll see lots of, if you, if you search, You'll see lots of positions for an analyst, right? Cybersecurity analysts, and even colleges are, I don't wanna say being deceptive, but being not as clear as they could be, uh, perhaps, that's one of the things. Oh, getting this degree, you can be a cybersecurity analyst, but only 3% of those jobs are held by people under the age of 30, naturally. It takes, before someone puts you in that job role, they want you to have some other experience. Um, or super mad skills, right? That's the only way you're gonna kind of overcome that. Um, so, but if you search for things like incident response, right? Hey, I need to understand how networks are put together. I need to understand things like network traffic analysis. I need to understand some forensics capabilities. And those are things you can learn. And it's a little easier to break into that because the job pool is much smaller. So, uh, those are, sort of the high demand places where we can get beyond that. 22% have done layoffs, um, but not in these fields, right? Analysts, people hanging around, yes. Um, but if you have high level of technical skills, you're not the person getting let go. And if you are, who cares? Because there's 20 other companies that are saying, I'm sorry, you know how to do this? Um, we don't have anyone on our staff that has that capability. That's a big, I mean, think memory forensics, right? So, oh, we've got eight people in our, but no one here really is good at memory forensics. You're, oh yeah, I, I'm, I'm all about that. I've done competitions, I've done these other things, see here, right? That 
differentiates you from all those other candidates. So, more All right. Um, look at that. I was talking kind of fast. So, they worried me because they kept showing me those signs that say, we're going to hold these up and say 10 minutes. So, um, but we do have about 10 minutes left. We posted it at 9.45. Um, that's my contact information, right? So, uh, Twitter, sorry, X handle, right, is uh, CyberLeo with a three. Uh, Facebook is C. Thornsburg, LinkedIn. You can search Chip Thornsburg or obviously at, at Northeast Lakeview. Um, if you have questions, happy to try and answer them. You might have to yell at me because I wear hearing aids and this room is horrible for that. Yes, sir. Um, so on the skills that you mentioned, are those from the survey results that you're getting back from managers, or is that just kind of general trends that you're seeing across the industry? The high demand stuff? That's just general observation. That, that seems to got those things that are out there, sort of where, the way things are trending. Um, the things that push towards some of the job fields, you've got the feds, but they're always a little bit lagging. Um, but if you look at things like insurance companies, if you look at some of those other banks, um, and you're seeing insurance companies tell their customers that, that, that have cyber insurance policies, like, you really should have forensic capabilities inside your company. Because when something bad starts to happen, it's not the time you go, we need to find a subcontractor to come in here and help us as the barn's on fire. Um, right, and so there's a sort of big push for that. I'm kind of follow up on that. Uh, from a, a pen testing perspective, I'm curious how often since you create these skills some of the things you're seeing there. I know that there's really high interest in research. So this is my opinion. So take this one for what it's worth. Um, most people that are wanting to get into cybersecurity, right, the same thing that you probably all keyed on, right, how to hack my way in, right? I want to get paid, right? I can be paid. I can make money to be a hacker. Yes, you can. But you think there's a lot of job applications for an analyst position <coughs> when a pen tester job opens up? There are thousands, and so in some ways it's a rush to the bottom, salary-wise, unless you are absolutely at just the elite level. Um, so a forensic-capable person gets paid way better than a pen tester. Not to, if that's what you want to do, be happy and do your thing, but that's that's probably the most competitive segment of everything. Sir? Uh, a couple of slides ago you talked about the hack-in-the-box competition. Uh -huh. is, is is that what it's called? So, uh, Hack the Box is a, so it's free to sign up. They, they've pivoted and they've started doing a lot of uh, training as well. They have Blue Team, but it's predominantly, it was designed for a red team. You get a, a VPN connection into their network, uh, and, and it says, hey, here's this box, they give you the IP. Try and break in. Um, and so you're going through all of those pen testing, Right, so you're doing all the scanning and enumerating, trying to figure out what open ports and what services it's running and all of that to see if you can find a way to compromise it. And the neat thing is those are all production. So there might be payment card systems, it might be a healthcare man records management, uh, it might be a, a domain controller. They have different types of devices that are in there. Um, it, they, those are challenging. Um, Did you get ranked? Yes, um, although it's going to take you a while. Literally, there's 350,000 people like, last time I checked on that. It's going to take you a while to get up there. If you do, so I, I actually am friends with the, the CISO. He had a, a, a young man that was working on his security team who really was in the top 50 in the world. Um, and he was fighting with their HR because he had no advanced degrees. And they're like, we can't pay him the amount of money that you think we need to pay this guy to stay. And he, he just had to tell them, do you not understand? The minute that he starts telling people he's in the top 50 in the world, he can go anywhere and work for anyone, and we need to keep him. And so they, they fought and fought and fought, but it went up like $50,000 a year uh, increase in salary just to keep him and hang on to him. So, and that's a Fortune 500 company, so um, he lives out there. Sir? Talking about uh, skills, experience, and knowledge. Um, and watch my fellow Stanley Miles before I believe in uh, to do this. Uh, what what are sort of certifications considered for that? Like knowledge or skills and 
I know that a lot of ways. So certif certifications kind of are on the education side, and so academics for a long time, but hey, you just need a degree, and then if you get your, site, your Security Plus, now you've got a certification, but if you've looked at CompTIA, Security Plus is not even listed as a security certification anymore. It's core. Um, they're pushing CISA Plus and some other um, things in, in that. So um, that's a, a double-edged thing. If you're going to work for a federal contractor, you're required by the feds to work. You must have a Security Plus. You've got to do that. Um, but it's like developing any other skill. If you if, if you're want to work in forensics, um, why try and get a pen test plus? Why try, I mean, so spending the time or OSC plus, some of those really great certifications, but they tend to be work role oriented. That, that's the thing I would caution you about. Um, typically, if I'm reviewing a resume and I see 27 certifications on there, I one think that this person just has way too much time on their hands, um, or it's like if they're not valid to what. I mean. So if I'm trying to hire a pen tester, I don't care that you have that uh, your PMP. I don't care that you're Agile certified. I don't care that you're a Sigma black belt. Right? Those things they're not relevant to the work role, and so that's the only thing I would caution you about certifications. Don't get them just to get them. And at this point, I can't imagine any employer who just opens the door because, oh, you have your Security Plus now. You and I don't even know what the, the millions of others uh, at this point. Uh, sir. How do you become part of these, some of these surveys? Because the, the data you shared there was pretty interesting. When we talked about like, how are you getting some of this data? Um, not that I disagree with it, it actually <laughs> followed quite along with some of the things we care about, but that'd be interesting to me. I, I do also have one other follow-up question. How did you see um, software development and full stack development um, as part of like you know what folks are looking for? I didn't see it there as like a, a major priority. Um, we did not survey anything for software development. Okay. Because that that was at, it's quite literally out of the scope of experience expertise for myself or Bart. Um, so that couple of slides came out of a much larger survey and, and that was an academic survey. We went through the, the IRB for uh, Texas State. Uh, there were a multitude of questions that were that were part of that. Those were just ones that were relevant to competitions. We also talked about certifications and which certifications and work roles and size of companies and there was a lot of other data in there. I just pulled those because they're relevant to competitions. Um, and yes, when you see a, something on a survey that says 96 percent of people are, uh, and so far it's held true, and it's held through two different two different rounds of surveying and different levels of, of people, and not just local. It wasn't a if you're an academic, we're running out of time. It wasn't a snowball sample. Is there a right? It wasn't just me surveying my friends and trying to get them, their friend to send it to someone else. So we were a little bit more rigorous than that um, in our in our surveying methods. So we did use social media for that first round. We pushed it out through technology groups that were out there, not not just sending it out through all my friends on LinkedIn agree with me. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, that's to be expected. So. Which is was the problem when we got the first ninety percent? We're like, that can't be right. Um, so I'm with you. I don't. I, I literally don't like that stat either. But it is what it is, and 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 we verified it, but it still is. Yeah. I'm like, okay, it's a, it's a really high stat. It is. It's like a Putin election result. You know? <laughs> yeah. It's like it's gonna be. It's the best ever. All right. Maybe one more. Are we out? We're done. Come on. Who's got a question? Are good. Um, Um, 
So I think that it won't matter, really, because I, I don't think that, and, and part of that is just getting your resume through um, the pre-screening AI that every big HR employer uses right now. And so part of that, if, if you're doing project-based work, even during school, that's experience. And so list it as, list it in your experience section, because it's, you're telling someone, I did this thing with these resources and here with my outcome. It doesn't really matter to them whether or not you were an intern or an unpaid intern, or I mean, that, that's not the important part. Um, it's documenting that you have the ability to do something. And again, a resume is just gonna get you, they're just gonna talk to you. So anything you put on there, right, as we close, make sure you can talk about it so <laughs> afterward. That, the ATS probably isn't gonna trigger off the word competition, but if you say you were in a competition and you used these skills, it'll catch the skills. Yeah, so thank you so much. Um, I need to get out of the way so the next person can come in and hang out there.